You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. And joining me now is the Haldeman Norfolk Member of Parliament and second-time Conservative leadership candidate, Leslin Lewis. Uh, Leslin, good to talk to you again. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Andrew. So obviously you came in the last leadership race as a relative political unknown to become quite nationally known, not just in the conservative movement in Canada, but also Canadian politics more broadly. Why are you running again now? What do you think is going to be different that might give you the victory this time around? Well, I'm I'm running again because I'm very concerned with the direction of our country. I think that there is just too much demonization in our policies and pitting Canadians against each other. I'm concerned with the fracturing that I see happening in the different regions and within society. And coming out of COVID, I think that we need someone who is going to unite us and focus on policies that instill hope and compassion and confidence. And I have the expertise that I feel that would I, I would like to dedicate with finding uh, environmental solutions, economic solutions. I'm concerned with our $1.3 trillion of debt and issues of fundamental freedoms are very, very important to me right now also. Yes, the last time you and I spoke, it was actually at the trucker convoy that very first weekend when a lot of people in this country who felt they had not been heard, they were not being respected, and in the case of of Justin Trudeau's comments, were being actively disrespected, all these people said, you know what, we have to take a stand, And, and you were one of, at the beginning, a small number of members of parliament that were prepared to go out and meet with these people. How do you ensure that the divisions that led to that don't continue, both inside the party and also just in Canadian society in general? Well, I think it's very important that when people are hurting, when they're traumatized, when they're trying to find solutions, and you have to remember many of these people, they reached out to their member of parliament. I received hundreds of um, probably I would say thousands of letters uh, from people who were concerned about the direction of the country. And all they wanted is for their elected officials whom they're paying their salaries to listen to them. And some of them drove from clear across the country from places like BC. And for me, it just wasn't, it wasn't too much to just listen to what they had to say. And I think that it was a very, very grave mistake for our prime minister not to listen and not to even um, even they have some of his ministers go and meet with them and, and listen to what they had to say because they are regular Canadians. They work with their hands. They, they are concerned about the future of the country. They're, many of them are not sitting in, in their cottages with a map book on a computer during COVID. Some of them were out of work and the mandates and and our policies directly affect them in different ways than it affects someone who's working in the office. And so I think it's very, very important to listen to their concerns. Looking at the trajectory that led to there being a conservative leadership race right now, the conservative performance in the last election, the caucus vote to expel Aaron O'Toole, do you feel the Conservative Party of Canada has done a good job in engaging not just the type of people that were protesting as part of the convoy, but in general people that may represent different factions of Canadian society and and the conservative movement? And, And if the party's not doing a good enough job, what would you bring to the table to change that? Well, I I do see our party as a microcosm of society. We're a big tent party. And so we have different people within our party with divergent beliefs. And and I think that that is uh, very, very important to keep the the essence of that in our society as, as something that's important to our democracy. So it's very important that even though I may have a different opinion than you, that you don't demonize me and I don't demonize you, that we hear our different perspectives. And sometimes in in hearing and listening, you find policies that we both agree on. But that's not where things are going. Right now, I see if you vote against a piece of legislation because the legislation is poorly drafted, people will label you, oh, you're anti this group, anti that group. Well, it may have been just, it was a poor piece of legislation. And so we have to move away from these labels and the demonization and pitting people against each other. 
And I think that if we're going to survive as a nation um, beyond COVID and, and come out of, of COVID a united country, I think that we, we really do have to focus on working together and, and bringing the different regions and the different factions within our party, within our nation together. Uh, you're unique among the others who have announced leadership campaigns and that you were in a similar spot just uh, two years ago. Is the platform that you're going to run on in this leadership going to be essentially a, a clone or a bringing forward what you ran on in 2020? Or are you trying a different approach this time? Well, I believe in the platform that I ran on. And so there are aspects of it that are going to be the same. But I would say just stay tuned. I think there'll be some things that are the same and there will be some surprises also, but we haven't fully put out our platform as yet, but um, we will be in, in short time. On social issues, you had a, a very candid approach. I know you had a lot of support from from social conservatives in the party, from some social conservative groups, and, and you had put forward an, a plan on abortion that had no hidden agenda. You laid out all your points. Is that something you see yourself uh, campaigning on this time around as well? Yeah, Andrew, you know, uh, issues like abortion are very polarizing. And actually, I don't think they have to be because I have a lot of friends who are pro-choice. And there are a number of issues that we actually, when we sit down and we, we talk, that we agree on. So what I've done is I, I know that not every woman, not every person, not every Canadian is going to agree with my personal beliefs on, on the issue. And so I like to ask people, well, what do you believe on the issue? And then find commonalities. So for example, a pregnancy care center, caring for our most vulnerable women, women who may not have had, uh, may not have planned their pregnancy to have care centers that are there to assist them in their time of need. The majority of women agree on. The majority of women also agree that um, we shouldn't promote misogyny in our society. And so um, targeting a baby girl in the womb because she's a girl, the majority of people agree that, that that's not right. And so sex selective abortion is something that the majority of Canadians, I think 78% agree on. And so there are things that the majority of Canadians do agree on, and it doesn't have to necessarily be a polarizing issue. I think politicians like for it to be, because then they can um, pit people against each other. But I think that if we find common grounds of issues that we agree on, then you can form policies around that. And there shouldn't be anything hidden about it. Um, we shouldn't have a hidden agenda about what kind of policies we believe are in the betterment of all Canadians. You just laid out a, a very sensible approach. I think some people might disagree. I think a lot of people, even those that aren't uh, in a, a camp, so to speak, would also find agreement in perhaps some of those spaces. At the same time, conservative leaders, especially the last two elections, have, have not communicated all that clearly the conservative platform and the conservative vision. And, and I look at the last election where at the very beginning of it, people had some concrete pledges that were in there that by the end of the campaign in 2021 ha had been abandoned abandoned by Aaron O'Toole. So how do you tell people that you're not going to go down the road that your predecessors would have gone down, that when you make these pledges in the leadership, these are going to be the same pledges that you campaign on in a general, and if you win, the same pledges you'd run on as a prime minister? I think people know me and they know that um, there's a level of authenticity there and that I will stand up for positions, even if it's going to cost me even if I'm penalized for it, because I believe in those positions. I believe that those positions are in the best interest of our country. And so I also believe in democracy. I believe, I trust the democratic process. I trust our members. And so when our members have policies, um, such as the carbon tax, uh, I think that it's very, very important that if you make a pledge saying that I am not going to have an individual carbon tax, and the members have uh, supported that, that you recognize that the reason why we got there is because of an analysis that the majority of people that will be most, uh, suffer the, the most burden of the carbon tax are the average, the average person, the average Canadian who is heating their home, who's driving to work. And so it's, it's an issue of 
do you want to just continue to tax people to change their behavior? Or do you want to have different policies such as education to encourage a change of behavior? Because we're going to get to a point where people it's no longer sustainable to continue to tax people. And so I trust the membership that they invoke policies and they come up with policies that are of benefit to the majority of Canadians. But then there are other issues like conscience rights issues, Andrew, that the membership may come up with a conscience rights issues. And I believe that um, there should be free votes on issues of conscience. And so I wouldn't and, uh, whip caucus on on issues of conscience. So there there's a distinction in in the policies. You mentioned being prepared to take a stand even if it costs you. So this I think lends itself very well to a question I wanted to ask you about electability here. Again, the last three elections, Justin Trudeau has defeated Conservatives, even when people were very optimistic. Is there a, a strategy you have as a leadership candidate that you take to a general on, on how you break through the walls that uh, Conservatives have been up, up against, whether it's in Quebec or the GTA or parts of British Columbia? Is there a path to victory that you're planning on and, and a way that you could tell members, yeah, I'm not just going to be a solid Conservative leader, but I'm going to win and here's how? Yeah, well, I think it's it's forming policies that unite Canadians. I, I see that the the lines of partisanship are are really really shifting. People are more focused on policies and principles rather than party loyalty. And I witnessed that from from the last election, just knocking at the doors. And Canadians want to know that you are going to implement policies that are in the best interest of all Canadians that unite Canada and that they can prosper and get back to the, the way things were where people are working and they're making a living where we are self-sufficient and we're not reliant on other countries for um, our natural resources and and in times of a pandemic we we have a, supplies that, that could that could assist our population. And so we need to get our house in order. And I believe that a focus on that is very, very important from our party. I also believe that we also need to reach out to uh, the growing demographics of our country in urban centers and focus, focus on those centers and, and let the people know that there is a place for them in our party and that our party is really uh, a microcosm of society where we have diverse perspectives and diverse beliefs and, and you're welcome with your beliefs within our party. Now, how do you go after, uh, and, and this is not just about ethnic diversity, but diverse voters in general, whether it's people that have different economic situations, different religions, different racial backgrounds, whatever the case may be, how do you go after communities and offer a unifying message without it going down that road of, of identity politics and, and pandering that I think oftentimes conservatives reject when uh, we see the liberals doing it? I think that Canadians we generally are looking for very similar things. The average Canadian, whether they're an immigrant, they or they were born here, they want to be able to provide for their families. They want to be left alone for the government, from the government to leave them alone. What a concept. <laughs> <laughs> so that they can live their lives and, and practice their faith without government interference and raise their children in accordance with their values. And they also I want to know that when they pay their taxes, the government is responsible and respects them and that there will be programs there for them in the future. And right now, all of that is in jeopardy because with $1.3 trillion of debt, we don't know whether or not our social programs even will be sustainable. And so that brings a lot of concern for vulnerable populations like the elderly, people on disability, and our, our, our um, veterans. Um, these are areas and people that, that want to know that government is responsible and, and that they're securing the future for them. 
just finally, Leslin, I, I had Pierre Polyev on the other day and I asked him about some of the competitors in the race and he had very kind words to say about you as a, a formidable force in the Conservative caucus. Just looking at the competition here, whether it's Jean Charest or Pierre Polyev or Roman Babber or Patrick Brown, are, are these all people that you could work with conceivably with you as leader and them in your caucus? Or if you're not successful, that either one of them as leader and you in their caucus? Is this a, a race that you think is, is full of friendly opponents? Well, I think that the the beauty about our party is that you could have four different candidates and they all believe four different things. And that's the beauty. So I think it's very important for our democratic process that our members see the divergent perspectives within the, the leadership race. And I have the utmost respect for anybody who puts their name in because it's 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 a lot of work and it's a lot of sacrifice and it's for me it's it's a labor of love um, extending my resources my time to the membership so that they can see that there is somebody that reflects their point of view and uh, I'm sure that the other candidates have um, are going to have very strong platforms and that we, we're not going to agree on everything. But I think that that's a part of uh, unifying our party, that we are able, no matter who gets in, that we are able to get behind that person and work towards making sure that we win the next election and that we restore confidence and faith and, and hope um, for Canadians. Alderman, Norfolk Member of Parliament and Conservative Leadership Candidate, Leslin Lewis. Leslin, thanks very much for your time. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.